What is up, wrestling fans? Welcome to another pay per view point edition of the Smart Out Moment Smack Talk podcast. I'm your host, as always, Tony Mango, and joining me, as always, is Robert D. Felice. We were all in, and now we're all out. We're not all out. We have a little bit left in us. As does Callum Wiggins. I'll be out in a few hours. <laughs> I'll be out. Uh, uh, who am I kidding? I don't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I'll be out in nah, 14 hours from now. I'll probably just be like, hey, hey, all right. I'm just going to. I'll, I'll be out in a couple hours, maybe after we do this, if not right away. <laughs> well, if you can't tell already by the everything that describes everything of what this is, we're going to be talking about All In, which just ended, that uh, pro wrestling indie event, which I shouldn't have to give you a backstory behind, because if you're listening to this, I'm pretty sure you know what the hell it is. <laughs> if you're not, and you you don't know what's going on, then I don't know how you came across this channel, but hey, how you doing? Uh, I unfortunately missed all of Zero Hour. I had thought that it would be able to like stream on you know the same platform as... Uh, all in itself and i looked up uh, an article ahead of time that said all in starts at seven and that it was labeled something along the lines i don't remember which website it was but it was something like all in starts at 7 p.m eastern 8 p.m for the main show so when six o'clock came around i was like oh, i thought that that's when the pre-show started and nothing was loading on the site and i'm like oh okay all right well i guess it is seven o'clock so at seven o'clock, I'm starting to click on there. Then it's like, all right, well, you know, as you just saw on zero hour. And I'm like, what the fuck? I just missed all this. So unfortunately, I have nothing that I can say about this. But did you both get a chance to watch zero hour? I did. Did you come? No, because I live in the UK. I do not I get was, WG okay, in America. That, that's interesting. I was going to ask that if you were able to watch it. How did you watch it? Okay, You, so you couldn't watch it on hour. WGN UK? No, although I did manage to catch some bits of the Battle Royale by less than, uh, like, less than, above, above board. Maybe, you so, yeah. unscrupulous bastard. No. <laughs> yeah, right, like, if I would have known, known that at the time, <laughs> I would have found that out, though, because I don't have WG in America either. Just got rid of it on Comcast, like, uh, a week and a half ago. That's well, since I pay far too much for cable, I do, <laughs> I do have WG in America, and... The show started, well, first of all, it started with Cody and the Bucks coming out, and they greeted the audience, and the first thing they did was say, let's blow the budget in the first few seconds. Who wants to see some pyro? And they <laughs> had a little pyro exhibition, and then the first match started, which was SCU versus the Briscoe Brothers, and I'm not going to drone on about it. It was a great tag match, but... If you've seen these two teams before, or any Briscoe match, really, you've seen this. It was good, though. Is that something to recommend going back and checking out? I would check out Zero Hour, but mostly for the Battle Royale. Hmm. What um, about the video package thing? Because I saw that there was like a 20-minute video package or something. Just like a generic, hey, this is how we got to this point, and that kind of thing, right? There wasn't a 20-minute video package on zero hour but they did show brief clips of the 20 minute cody versus all this video package that you can watch on the nwa youtube channel okay so that's what that was then um the battle rail itself is where i started to realize that maybe with our predictions we put a little too much stock in the idea of these crazy surprises. There really were none except for the the victor. And well, there I'm... was, if I, uh, if my notes were right from what I had seen, we had missed four people. Yeah. Like, they had announced 11 and it was supposed to be 15. And those four were uh, Billy Gunn's kid. Yes, Austin Gunn. Cheeseburger. Yeah, Cheeseburger was there. Uh, Hurricane Helms. Yes. Tommy Dreamer. Okay, so we there was more than four. Yeah, because so, then that's Bully Ray and the, and the winner of the match, Flip Gordon. Yes. All right, so they say, were there was five people. So was anybody not able to well, be that, in the match that was like well, that was previously? Also, 
there was also Chuck Taylor and Trent Beretta as well. Okay, actually, so they yeah, just... actually turned so I guess off. it was about a 1920. They did say that it would just be a random number, however many they settled on. Yeah, okay. a 19 person one in the end. Well, that makes more, a lot more sense then, because I was just kind of like, I didn't know if my numbers were off or something, because of course I didn't get a chance to watch it, so like I would have been counting at the time. All right, you know, Wikipedia at the very least, don't know the most trustworthy uh, thing in the world. It says 19 person, so... Um, we had ran down those couple of names beforehand and, uh, Trent Beretta, that was another one. Yeah. And Chuck Taylor. That Okay. So kind of question I want to bring up there. I had no idea that Billy Gunn had a kid that was in wrestling. Is Austin Gunn actually like something to pay attention to? He's exactly like Billy Gunn in my eyes, which could be a good or bad thing, depending on how you feel about Billy Gunn. But because Austin Gunn and Billy Gunn were in this match, there were so many crotch chops and the microphones were loud and you could hear them just repeatedly saying, suck this, no, suck this. And it was just like, I was actually watching with a few people who are not wrestling fans at the time and they were just like, what is with all of the suck my dick conversation? <laughs> <laughs> because th there were spots there where... Billy Gunn told somebody to suck it, and then Jimmy Jacobs, who was wearing a dress for this match, by the way, told Billy Gunn, no, you suck it, and then he grabbed his dick, and then he kissed him. It was just, like, there was a lot of weird stuff in this battle royal that kind of dissipated once the guns got eliminated. Um, Marco's stunt is small, but very very energetic and very full of heart. Any Bully other standout Ray, kind of people? Uh, Bully Ray, who uh, the first thing he did was powerbomb El Hijo del what are they, El, El Hijo de, Ch de Chico through a table, who of course ended up being Flip Gordon under a mask and that's how Flip Gordon won the thing. Bully Ray really stood out. I don't watch a lot of Ring of Honor. I guess they're really pushing him hard as a heel. I don't know. And I did think that they were going to go with my idea for Colt Cabana because it was Bully and him were the final two before Chico got back in the ring and pulled off the mask. And I was kind of sad that they didn't go with my idea. Well, I love the idea that this show kind of like in, I mean, of course they did some stuff on YouTube and some different things like that, but they really didn't have the same type of build that like a WWE show would have or impact or anything like that. And they still managed to end up having some good stories for this. So I hadn't seen the zero hour battle Royal or anything like that, but later on in the night when they referenced and called back to it, I was like, Oh, that's actually really neat. I like that. It's pretty like simple storytelling and nothing. That's like so crazy that I wouldn't have seen it potentially coming, but uh, you know, I did know that Flip Gordon was this type of guy leading up to this where it was like, nah, Flip Gordon's not going to be on the show. And to have him come out in a mask and then be like, haha, I actually found my way into the show and stuff like that. Like, that's really old school and great. So yeah, hats Cal off to them. And I had actually talked about, you know, wanting to bring up Flip Gordon, but not getting the chance to on the previews. And I did think it was a good story. The only other thing I would want to mention is Jordan Grace was phenomenal and she is definitely something special i i i have to say that i am um, i obviously i didn't get to see the entirety of the battle royal but it seemed to me she just sat down for the majority of it and then had her spot at the end yeah but once they gave her her spot i was like really impressed by her and to be fair a lot of people as is the case with battle royals there was a lot of like sit and wait for your spot because the opening was a lot of dives to the outside which i was very confused by for a battle royal but there was a lot of high energy in the beginning and there was a lot of like you know lay down and cool off and wait for your spot kind of stuff huh. uh, i'm gonna check it out at some point whenever I get a chance to, I'm sure some website somewhere is going to be able to upload it and I'll be able to check it out or something like that. But if I do, I'll drop a comment below maybe and tell you guys if I think of anything different. Um, 
But before we go into the main show, I just want to bring up, you know, slight like aside, StarCast. Uh, I got a chance to check out basically four sections of it on uh, the previous night. And my general thoughts, it felt like Comic-Con sort of to me, which is really cool. And no surprise, really, because Cody Rhodes is a big comic book fan. So he's been to Comic-Con, I'm sure, a bunch of times and stuff. Now, I've never been to San Diego Comic-Con, but I've been to New York Comic-Con and so on and so forth. So uh, that feel, very cool. And even though it doesn't have the same type of budget and resources as Access does, I've been to Access, and it kind of sucked. Now, it was WrestleMania 29. WrestleMania 29 wasn't the best or anything like that. But by the time I left Access, I was thinking to myself, did I really want to spend all that money for that? You know, like the best thing I got out of Access was the story of Rikishi throwing my card away. <laughs> That's not really the best thing to look forward to, you know? Um, But I got to say, man, the panels that I had checked out, they weren't that good. I watched... Oh. uh. I, I skipped through the Matthew Bachamania one. I watched like maybe a quarter of it and I was just like, I can't watch any more of this. Uh, cause the comedians weren't funny. And Matthew was just kind of awkward. Did you guys check that one out by any chance? Well, I saw bits and pieces of Bachamania, but I just want to say, I'm glad somebody was able to get some full usage out of, Starcast because I was so busy I barely got to check out <laughs> Starcast. Well, don't watch the uh Sped My Days karaoke. No. I was looking forward to that. I was gonna go back and watch it tonight. Terrible. Oh. It's literally Jeff Jarrett and Bruce Pritchard hanging out going like, Oh man, isn't this fun? Isn't this fun? That's a lot of fun here. And Pat Patterson being like, I want to sing again. I want to sing. And Pat Patterson does a good job. He sings uh, Wonderful World. He sings, of course, because everybody fucking does it, My Way. It's like the one go-to song everybody does other than Bohemian Rhapsody. And then you get a bunch of, like, random fans coming up and singing. And it's like, I don't give a shit about, like, hey, Chris uh, Anderson from Birmingham. He's going to come up and, you know, sing some... Yeah, honky tonk song or whatever and it's just kind of like oh i already hate country music don't care about this random fan you know whatever go watch um elite karaoke with marty skull because that was much better well that was disappointing the uh the monday night war debate was, wasn't really a debate but it was still like fun that was the, my favorite thing because it was just kind of um, them bullshitting a little bit so that was my least favorite thing because I'm just dead tired of the same talking points. Like, bring up something different. Yes, we know. You know, Hogan jumped ship and Razor jumped ship. And, oh, my God, how did you feel when the fake... Yeah, we've heard the same, like, three or four talking points. Well, you know, one of the parts that I liked a lot was when somebody said, if you could pick ten people, which, of course, they shortened to three because it's like, you know, can't spend 20 minutes on it. If you could pick three people that you would want to start your own promotion with now, who would it be? And they both went with Roman Reigns and people are like, boo. And they're like, they both had this mentality. They're like, he is your guy and you guys are eventually going to turn around and you're going to love him and all this other kind of stuff, which made me go, are they just company men? Like, are they still just kind of like, eh, it's going to work. It's going to work. You know, that kind of thing It's kind of strange. Uh, I like that better, though, than for sure the uh, roast of Bruce Pritchard, because, woof, no, that was terrible. Uh, you, you don't get people to go up, and of course, if you're not a comedian, then you're not a comedian, but all the people like Brutus Beefcake and all them, they come up and they're like, hey, I'm not a comedian, I'm not really funny, uh, I don't really know what I'm doing here, so... All right, I'll see you later. <laughs> it's kind of like, okay, let's cut to a random comedian who I've never heard of before who says over and over again, I'm Jewish, as if like that's like a joke I'm supposed to laugh at. 
couple of good jokes here and there. Jerry Lawler spontaneously came in. They kind of like mercifully were like, Lawler, can you please come in here? And he did one good joke about how he, uh, he's like, everybody's going to make fun of me for always being with younger women. But hey, you know, I'm not embarrassed about being with younger women. Well, unless I have to take them to school. Or if I, <laughs> or if I take them out to dinner and they order Pischetti, that's kind of embarrassing. <laughs> Only a couple good jokes like that. The rest of it was kind of just two hours of just like, God damn, man, when's this going to end? So I don't know about any of those stuff. I don't know about like the, um, like the Shivani thing or. Shivani was funny when Medusa was there. The rest of it got kind of awkward. Um. I watched the one two three sixty with uh, the outsiders. Great, because the click is always funny together. Yeah. You know, um, I wanted to check out Johnston's thing. I didn't see that on the the listing for fight. Hmm. I don't know, but if anybody's curious about that and they want to go back and check that stuff out, I definitely say skip the roast, one hundred percent, and skip the karaoke. And for that matter, probably skip the Botchmania thing, too. I don't know. Uh, All right, so let's talk about the main card itself, now that we took out all the pre-show and extra preamble-type stuff out of the way. Started with a match that wasn't announced ahead of time. They This uh was spontaneously added, wasn't it? Well, can we say, first of all, how it started for me, which was on the Fight TV? Yeah, uh, which let's talk about that. Which a completely blank screen or, like, would f- was failing to load for a about five minutes oh yeah error code twenty three thousand or whatever it was and yeah yeah so so basically me and i'm sure basically everyone else who was watching through the fire tv app was refreshing constantly for a good solid like three to five minutes trying to see whether this show was actually going to be a massive fail immediately but it's yeah. not <laughs> running properly I mean, well keep in mind I, there, I wasn't even getting an error code i just got no website at all just a 502 bad gateway Oh, see, you got that. I got, I had started out and it said like, here's the countdown. And then as soon as it went to the countdown changed, it said the error code. And I was like, okay, let me just refresh this error code. All right. Let me try to refresh this error code. All right. I've been having a lot of issues with Firefox lately because Firefox quantum sucks balls. So let me undo all of my ad blockers. Maybe it's that. Nope. Error code. All right. Let me just try fucking Google Chrome. Even though I have a lot of issues with Chrome too every once in a while. Click on Chrome and it says 500 bad gateway. And I'm like, all right, this this is clearly a server problem and stuff. So at that point, I didn't even know that the zero hour thing hadn't started yet either. So then by the time I clicked on it and it was like 708 or whatever, uh, and it actually started working, they had already started this and they were already talking about the zero hour. And I was just kind of like, okay, zero hour couldn't have just been eight minutes long. <laughs> I clearly missed an hour. And like 10 minutes or something. But yeah, that sucked. But hey, you know what? They turned it around. They fixed whatever the problem must have been. And before we even uh, go past this point, too, I got to say, beyond that and a couple little things here and there where like the feed cut out for a split second or something like that, the production values for the show were phenomenal. Everything looked really crisp. It looked like the lighting was great, like major step up from even something like uh, like Impact. Even just like a regular Ring of Honor, I thought that this took that to the next level. This, and I, and this didn't seem to, to, to me didn't seem like any more better production value than your standard Ring of Honor pay per view. Have you see, did you see the entrances? They I mean, had the entrance like... ramp was pretty good, but like I've seen the uh sparkler pyro or uh ring of honor entrances and stuff like that before it's i mean it was, it was not like is it was that a recent anything. thing because i have never seen that i've seen before. a lot for dalton castle's entrences and stuff like that mm-hmm. so they do they do do that sort of thing and I, I think it was it's not like it was bad or anything i just think you could probably overstate it well since i haven't been watching ring of honor and stuff like that the last time i had seen a ring of honor thing didn't look anything like this so that was really shocked. I was just kind of like, you know what? This would have been like impact level. I would have been like, hey, you know what? It's like a random show. It makes perfect sense. And once the feed connected and everything, I was just like, wow, the picture quality is fantastic. The like everything looks really clean. It looks like they've got enough people working 
around the ring and behind the scenes and everything like that. The stage looked so much bigger than I expected it to be. Didn't expect him to have a giant Titan Tron, or I guess whatever you would want to call it. You can't really call it a Titan Tron because it's not Titan Sports. But that was a real shock to me. And that was my first reaction to this beyond the whole like, oh, God damn it, I can't get this started and I missed an hour. Then it was just like, shit, this looks legit. Of course, I missed well, most of Matt Cross defeating MJF. But <laughs> what do you think? Oh, who do you think lent the most staff? Billy Corgan's team, or you think that was ninety-five percent Ring of Honor? No idea. Yeah, I can couldn't say. Who was running Gorilla, for that matter? Young Bucks, right? The Young yeah, Bucks. Yeah, they seem like they were. Yeah. So I wonder who was running it for the, the main event. Cody. Yeah, I presume they were just switching out between... I assume, for the most part, between the shows, all three of them, just the parts where Cody and the Young Bucks had to be out there. Cody, you need a, a watch, man. <laughs> we'll get to maybe that. When, maybe when it was just Cody, it was like uh, Cody and maybe Omega as well. Yeah, maybe something like that. But hey, you know what? Being a wrestler doesn't mean that you are, you know, a production guy. And that's why they have people like Kevin Dunn and stuff in WWE. But they still ended up doing a pretty damn good job with this kind of thing. Like, there were hiccups, but there's going to be hiccups. And this could have been a complete mess. And it wasn't. So, my hat's off to them. If I was wearing a hat right now, I'd take it off to them. I don't really wear hats all that much. Um, the first match was Matt Cross defeating MJF. I have never heard of either of them before. I don't know what MJF stands for. And I didn't Maxwell get to really... Maxwell Jacob Friedman. Okay. All right. So, it's not like major jobber failure or something like that. <laughs> But speaking uh, of Major and Jobber, he was trained by Kurt Hawkins. Huh. There you go. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have nothing to say about it, though, because, I, like I said, I really didn't get a chance to check it out. What did well, you guys think? It, it was it was a good match, you know. I, I think Matt match. Cross deserves it, so I was cool with it. By the end of the show, I was starting to think maybe they shouldn't have done it. And save some time by cutting that one out. But, yep. Know. Maybe you should have thrown those two in the Battle Royal instead. MJF does strike me as someone that will be a, a pretty big deal in the next few years. He does like come him. across the. A, he's a, very he, charismatic, right? Yeah, he's got a lot of like character. He knows how to play to the crowd. The crowd hated him from the moment he came out, so he's obviously well known as a dislikable heel across the independent circuit. Matt Cross, I'm only really familiar with for his work as um, Son of Havoc in Lucha Underground. Um, yeah, it was a it was a decent match. It's nothing, nothing that I'm gonna like remember, like live long in the memory beyond that point. But it it was good just to get the crowd warmed up. They had like the perfect spot as like being the opener for the main card. So I mean, the crowd is gonna be into it no matter what. Let me just say, I think they might have been booing MJF because he was one of the few people who was actively trying to be a heel throughout his time at StarCast because I had to put up a, quite a few different interviews for WrestleZone and even notorious heels like Sammy Callahan were just like, yeah, man, I'm loving all in. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, MJF was like, get away from me. Your breath stinks. I want nothing to do with you. And I made a lot of money on these fat, dumb marks. <laughs> okay, I like them. <laughs> maybe i'll check them out later or something uh the second match of the main card was christopher daniels defeating Stephen amell special guest referee jerry lynn that got a big pop yeah he made me laugh during this one Stephen amell uh he came out as part of bullet club i actually for some reason just didn't see that coming i don't know why it's totally a stupid thing on my part of course he would come out with bullet club he's part of the well, whole yeah. thing like that he's a, he's a part of the bullet club yeah i was just kind of like oh look at that he's coming out and then i'm like yeah no shit <laughs> you know one of those things uh Stephen amell's not a wrestler so clearly yeah i'm gonna okay. cut him some slack he had some nice spots here and there and stuff like he did a nice falcon arrow for somebody who doesn't know nobody how Nobody kicks out of know. Falcon Arrow, by the way. <laughs> you know, pretty much everybody did. The, the the spots were fine. His selling is atrocious. Absolutely yeah. atrocious. Like the, the kicks in the corner, it was it was just sitting there taking them. It's like, can you at least act like you're being hurt in this situation? Like he's an actor, he should be able to do that at least. 
Yeah, you would think that that would be his strength, would be selling. Yeah, and yeah, he it, it was. This, this was a difficult to watch. Like I know I have to take some element out of it because, like you say, he's not actually a wrestler. But like there was, after watch, I thought going into it like, oh, Daniels is so experienced; he'll be able to guide him through this match, and it will look pretty good. After it, I was just thinking this was such a waste of Christopher Daniels on this show. Yeah. I have to agree. Well, you know, maybe they could have done something else. Maybe they could have had, like, if they cut the MJF and Matt Cross match, maybe the Briscoes and Stephen Amell could have teamed up and it could have been another six-man tag or something like that. Like, Yeah, probably something there to like, hide him a little bit more. I'm not going to say, but I give full credit to what he was able to accomplish in the ring. Like, I wouldn't have wanted to take that table spot. No, the table uh, spot was good. I liked yeah. how the fans started chanting Broken Arrow after that. That was funny. Yeah. And Daniels put together a, a decent match to do the thing. I like the fact they did the callback to the um, the usual way that Daniels loses matches when doing the uh, fall, like uh, the yeah, Angels' win. wings by uh, doing the flip over into the, um, like, like that sort of pinion predicament. And it's only because Daniels is holding on to it for too long that he gets pinned. But they decide to go against it. And I think it was the right. In the end of the day, it was the right decision to have Daniels win the match. Yeah, definitely. Because, I mean, he's the wrestler. He should be able to win. And yeah. it, Jerry, Jerry Lynn was fun, though. Yeah, I, mean, he, I liked when he threw them back into the ring. That was fun. I loved, by the way, the reference from the commentary team of Chekhov's table. Because I've brought up Chekhov before. And people have been like, what do you mean? Oh, you know. It just proves me right. That's a writer's term. Chekhov's gun. Check it out. If they're going to set up something like that, it should pay off. And, you know, it's just validation on my part. I like the coast to coast. That was cool. Oh, that was yeah, a good spot. Was yeah. Cool. He, he's clearly, like, incredibly athletic. And I think given a few years training, he could actually be really good at this. But he's not going to do that because he doesn't need to because he's got his own acting gigs and stuff like that. But he could take it up seriously if he wanted to. Season two of Arrow was better than this. I'll say that. This was better than season four. Of I don't Arrow. know if that's a compliment or not. <laughs> and season five. And I'm assuming everything after that, because that's when I stopped watching. But yeah, season two of Arrow was great. Uh, <laughs> he did better than I thought he was going to. And like you said, the right calls made Christopher Daniels wins. He should have won. He still looked good in the end, even in losing Stephen Mel, I mean. And, uh, you know, after not being able to see the match that was before it and stuff. I was like, all right, I'm going to hold off a little bit on going like, Oh, this isn't really all that fantastic. I don't know why everybody's going crazy and stuff. It wasn't the best match of the night that I had seen. It's out of the matches that I did see. It was the worst. I would, I would say just as it's a good point, because it wasn't like the greatest match of all time. The crowd was still really into it. And the crowd was fantastic the entire night. Yeah. yeah. They never tapered off at all. Speaking of the crowd, man, it's great not to have to see uh, Tall Lisa in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did see Lesnar guy. We had John <laughs> Meyer in the front row instead. Yeah, what was that? He, I'm like, I know that guy, and they go, oh my god, John Mayer's here. Like, yeah. Fuck yeah. Random aside of just people being in the uh, whole vicinity of the whole thing, great to hear Justin Roberts again. Yeah, uh, and that was good, yeah. For that matter, too. I kind of miss Sean Mooney. Yeah. I mean, like, I've been watching some old WWE stuff, and Sean Mooney will pop up here and there and stuff, and, you know, he's a little bit over the top and everything like that, but the way that he had his whole, like, backstage interview and stuff like that, I was just kind of like, I like Sean Mooney. What the hell? I kind of want to take that guy back a little bit. If we're going to go on to the broadcasting side of things now, I'd say Don Callis was fantastic the entire night. I think I'm commentary. Uh, except for one spot. Well, maybe just the one. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, the commentary I... team was pretty damn good. Like, nobody pulling a Taz and just, like, stuttering over nonsense or nobody being... Nobody asking how much anybody weighed. Yeah, none of that kind of stuff. And, and we even I had... had uh... Coach, you're a moron. Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah, it was like, they told the stories the way that I would like WWE to tell the stories where they don't need to go so far over the top and everything like that. And just kind of be like, remember, this is what we want you to think. It was more so this is what's happening. 
think what you want. And in general, I think that that's a really good positive for this kind of show. It's better to tell people what you, I guess, steer them a little bit into the direction that you're trying to go, but give them enough room to make their own opinions. Because if they're formulating their own opinion, they're having more fun. Kind of the same as like with a movie. If a movie ends with, you know, okay, something's a little bit ambiguous and maybe it could go this way or maybe it could go another way. A lot of people start going and, you know, discussing what they think. Now, of course, it doesn't work for everything like that. But in the context of WWE, they are beating you over the head so much of just this is exactly what we want you to think. And that gets very frustrating. And then it becomes kind of like, all right, well, I don't feel like thinking of that. And this this was different. So I enjoyed that a lot. I enjoyed not having things crammed down my throat. You know, wasn't the biggest fan of, uh, Emma on commentary to Neil Dashwood. Yeah, yeah, she was bad. Uh, but Mandy Leon looks great. So, <laughs> you know? and she was actually good on commentary. She has a lot more personality. Yeah. Emma seemed very. Can we call it Neil, please? <laughs> Sorry. It's not Emma anymore. Sorry. I just force a habit. Neil seemed very uninterested and just dry for some reason yeah um she never had the biggest personality in the world so i don't know why they really necessarily put her on that spot but i guess it was just kind of like like slighted that she wasn't actually on the show maybe i don't i don't want to just presume maybe she was supposed to be before the psoriasis broke out yeah that could be the case and if that's the case it's like it's not necessarily her, her fault but it's certainly not anybody else's fault you know no so that was kind of weird, um, but that was in our Four Corners survival, I think is what they called it. That is what they called it. was Tessa Blanchard defeating Madison Rain, Britt Baker, and Chelsea Green. A couple of notes that I had had on there. Number one, <laughs> my note says, LOL, tech dudes, uh, tech dudes not paying any attention. <laughs> That's when uh, Madison Rain and Tessa Blanchard almost bumped into the guy with cables, and he was just kind of like, oh shit, Like I don't know, people were heading towards me. Um, all four looked fantastic. Um, I know Peyton in the Mega Maniacs chat was saying like, Hey, Madison rain just had like a kid and she still has that kind of body on her and stuff. But on top of just like the physical side of things, they all looked like they are just big stars. Tessa Blanchard in particular. Now we're botches. I was going to ask you if this is your first Tessa Blanchard match. Isn't nope. she phenomenal? No, not my first match that I had seen her in, because yeah, I've seen her in WWE and classic. stuff. But I was really impressed with her back then, and I thought, oh, she's guaranteed to get signed. And then when she didn't, I was just kind of like, well, what the fuck are they sleeping on? And now, even more so, I look at this and I just go, all right, well, if they don't sign her somewhere down the line, there has to be some kind of bigger issue. Either she is like, I want more money, which I would think if that's the case, she didn't go to Impact, or she has like a behavioral problem or something like that. In no capacity can I think that anybody in WWE would look at her and go, I don't know if there's anything there. She looks great. She wrestles better than a lot of the people that are in WWE. Same thing for that matter for Britt Baker. Same thing for Chelsea Green. Madison Rain. She was the weak link. I'll admit it. Yeah. She hit a disgusting looking RKO from the top. And it just something about it just fell apart and it didn't look pretty or safe at all and she there was a couple of botches in this yeah. she did she did better than i thought she was going to which might be not saying a lot because i thought she was really gonna like, like join. take off yeah take off the flow of this match i'll just say for the overall of this match and i'm probably gonna get might get some like stick from this in comments or whatever this match is going to be as good, if not better, than anything we see at WWE Evolution. You know, I was going to say, this was probably my second least favorite match of the night, maybe in a certain capacity, but I also liked it, so it's like not saying, like, oh, you know, it's not fucking awful or something. Like that. Oh, I, I, I love this but, match. I thought this was better than... This would definitely be my top half of the matches of the night. But the, uh, the botches took away from me a little bit, specifically the ending of it. Yeah, the uh, ending was awkward. If you hadn't had that, then it would be a lot higher for me. Just yeah. the just the confusion over whether they broke it up or not. They really just shouldn't have gone for it or not have gone as close as they did. 
Well, I think what added to it was there was this brief moment beforehand where the crowd was just like, yeah, women's wrestling. And they probably got so sucked in by the moment that it just took their pace off a little bit. And when both girls dived to make it seem like they were going to break up the pin, everything just seemed off. But I think it was mostly because of that. They were shaken by 10,000 people <laughs> maybe cheering for them, yeah. you know? I mean, there were a few points where I thought the match was going a little bit too long. But then but then they hit a big move and the crowd got right back into it again. So I think in terms of the actual pacing of the match, I thought it was actually pretty good. Uh, Chelsea Green, I thought, was the star of the match. I thought she really stood out. I really like her hot mess gimmick. It really suits her well. She plays it fantastically. I like the two-faced thing. Yeah, the broski boot was also a nice touch, just to take a, a page out of Zack Ryder's book. And uh, also uh, uh, Britt Baker coming out to Adam Cole's theme music was also yeah. was also a nice touch. I did think that because of that, she was going to yell out, Britt Baker, baby, but she didn't. <laughs> yeah, see, a little touch like that completely lost on me. I didn't know that that was his music from before. Yeah. It's a, it's a nice little thing for like people that've been following their careers a little bit longer, but like, yeah, like if if you get explained it to you, if you haven't watched it before, you probably say, oh, that is quite that's quite a clever thing to do. And as they said on commentary, Tony, Britt Baker is a real dentist, unlike that Isaac Yankum. I didn't catch that. That's good. I mean, overall, I like the match. I think all four women, to a certain extent, ended up doing a, a great job and. Again, Madison Rain, the weak link of the of the bunch, but still not necessarily like, oh man, she's bad or something like that. I I've liked Madison Rain. She was also the I, one that got the frostiest reception. It seemed like the crowd didn't know whether to cheer her or not. Uh, she's Probably been bad. mostly a heel, right? Well, yeah, but like, she, no, nobody going into this match was meant to be like a designated heel, except maybe Tessa Blanchard. But she came out like hugging her father and Magna uh, T A and, and some little kid. I don't yeah, know I, assume, it is. I assume it's like grandson or something like that, or a nephew maybe. But it's it's something along the lines of it's Tessa's like, uh, grandson. She looks good for her age. <laughs> <laughs> but Madison Ray, I think it's just the case of she's a bit overexposed, and also the WWE thing is probably a lot of people probably came to this with a fuck the WWE attitude. You know, they did give her nice props on commentary. They said Madison Rain just this year alone has competed in Women of Honor, Impact Wrestling, now all in the Mae Young Classic, and she just sent her five-year-old off to kindergarten. She's a badass mom. I thought that was like a nice little touch. Yeah, it is, it is a nice touch, but for other people looking and hearing that sort of thing, they probably go sensitive. Okay, so she's like everywhere. Can we maybe do something without her for a change? It's like hmm. she's she's been far too overexposed, especially for her level of ability. Well, I agree with you about how this is probably still going to top anything that we will see at Evolution, especially now that we keep getting more information about what the Evolution card might be shaping up to be. And if it comes down to it and stuff, then hey, we, at least we got you know, the majority of this match was pretty good. Then out of all the like so all the surprise in the world, they say to you know, hey, we're gonna go to the NWA World Title match, and I was just like, wait, what? Because I thought this for sure would be one of the top two matches of the night, if not the main event. And eh, well, I'm dead wrong. Uh, Earl Hebner as the referee, he <laughs> they shouldn't have given him that microphone. <laughs> yeah. He's, I laughed so hard when he was like, all right, this is for the NWA World's title. Uh, <laughs> I was like, oh, God. He said, there's hard to remember what to say. And he's just like, uh, and I've known you both for a long time, and I'm happy to be here. Yeah, it was. I was just all like, right. man, this is, this is kind of awkward. But um, another random note that I had, my God, Brandy Rhodes. Like, yeah, that was that was a nice <laughs> a, a nice look. As soon as she came into WWE, the very first time that she popped up, I'm like, yeah, she's uh she's pretty gorgeous, 
And a lot of people were like, no, it's not that bad. And I was just like, what? <laughs> like over the course of the past couple of tournaments that we had had, I remember trying to push for her a lot more and I don't get how there wasn't more of a response for her. She is really just like a knockout. I'm sure there would be now. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. But the sort of ties that she wears, like, especially in like new Japan and ring of honor, like, presenting Cody to the ring she that's kind of par for the course for her that kind of look thumbs up among other things uh the entrances were great loved that they had a real big fight feel to them I laughed when it was like hey DDP's there and Tommy Dreamer and Glacier (laughs) what the fuck is Glacier doing there and then when it comes to Nick Aldis it's like hey he's got Jeff Jarrett next to him and Davari, and I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> These were some weird uh, ensembles, let's say. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I could kind of understand the DDP. Tommy Dreamer, I wasn't really expecting. Glacier, I certainly wasn't expecting. I think Glacier was like Cody's, for real, like Cody's gym teacher or something. Huh. Probably and... how he got a job in WCW. Might have been, actually. Has some sort of connection to Dusty Rhodes, and you probably got a job. I was very surprised that Cody didn't have, like, some lavish outfit on for his entrance. I think it's because he was meant to be the baby face. Yeah. It's kind of of something the heel would do, really. And boy, was Cody the baby face. Yeah. I mean, he looked like a major star. Yeah, he did. And you could just... This was my personal favorite match from a story standpoint because from the minute you saw him, the emotion was just etched into his face. And you could just see how overwhelming of a moment this was for him. And the crowd rallying behind him. And then they didn't even see all this. His name flashed on the Tron and you just hear 10,000 people go, boo! And I just, I haven't seen a match where the heel and babyface were that defined in so long. It felt oh, that's good because, match. I mean, watching WWE where the heel right now is Braun Strowman and the babyface is Roman Reigns. <laughs> it's like. I was going to say, were you not watching uh, Champa versus Gargano the first time? <laughs> Kind of like that. That's yeah. true. Uh, I'll give you that. That's true. Gargano versus the devil. I mean, and it's different with this one because, like, because like Nick Aldis wasn't well. He obviously became the heel in the match. I think that's the way they're going to structure it. But he he wasn't behaving like a heel in the lead up to the match. He just wasn't Cody. <laughs> Anybody know watch? if he's been a heel in like the NWA kind of circuit? A little bit, but he's been he he, he mixes matches. It depends on who his opponent is, really. Like, I think predominantly he's been a heel, but it's it's he's never been like so overstated about it that he would be hated by everybody. Did you keep up with ten pounds of gold and all of the stuff? Not really. No. Such a good story told. I would invite all of you to go back and watch the, the story. Such a great story told. We've seen the ending now. We spoiled it. Yeah, and. I, I love this match. I mean, yes, it's not the match that fits into the rest of the high octane, high energy matches that All In were was, but this match was so good. Except for the one awkward thing where Cody he leaped off trying to go for a springboard dive, and Magnus caught him with a punch. And Earl Hebner threw up the X, and it looked like he was seriously hurt or seriously concussed because they even had Davari push Paige and then get in the ring and push Hebner just so Paige could hit Davari with the diamond cutter. And at that point, I really felt like, okay, Cody's hurt, concussed, and they're buying him time. Mark what do you guys think of that? <laughs> Why else would they have Paige diamond cut Davari? It just seemed to get a pulp. Yeah, just to be like, hey, wouldn't it be fun if we did a, you know, little spot like this where he thinks that he's injured and all that? Give him time to do that blade job. I think think it was just 
the a storytelling aspect. Cody is a master of storytelling, and he makes up for his. I don't want to say inefficiencies in the ring. I mean, this was a match that kind of just showed that Cody is a very good wrestler, but he's not a great wrestler. It's it's a situation where with the right opponent, like an Okada, like an Omega, he can have great matches, but it has to be with a great performer next to him. With Aldis, who's a good another very good wrestler, it's just a bit slow, a bit formulaic. I I like the old school nature of it, but and. Cody getting colour and stuff like that. That it all fits into the narrative that he's Dusty Rhodes' kid, so he's going to have a Dusty Rhodes style match for the NWA Championship. But it was just a bit still weird. It was it was slow, and it went. I think it went on about five minutes too long. I liked the uh, the elbow drop on Brandy. It was yeah. it was a good it was a good touch. Like initially, I was kind of a little bit yeah, about it because already Aldis was being the heel and. It's it was Brandy who decided to do that. It wasn't like Aldis knew she was gonna be there. So to have him have people call him an asshole out after it and stuff like that, I was like, well, it's not his fault. She was the one that actually went there. He was like halfway across the ring when he decided to when she decided to cover it. But the idea that Brandy's kind of always been like Cody Rhodes' lifeline almost. I think it's just a nice that she'll be willing to sacrifice herself just to protect her husband. It makes her look like a very strong character. So Cody insisted on having the hair dyed for this. Do you think he did that because he felt like the bleach blonde would, you know, kind of get messy with the blood and there would be a better visual? Well, he's been trying to do the... He's, he's, he primarily does the bleach blonde thing. He, the only reason he dyed his hair back was because he had a, a role... He was filming for the Arrow series. That's the only yeah, reason why I you know what? Yeah. It looks strange, but at the same time, I think it looks better on him. Well, that's yeah. I mean, it's it's gotten used to it now, and I mean that's just his way of trying to look like his dad and Ric Flair. So I I think we'll we'll stick to seeing the the bleach bronze look going forward. I'm all for it, and I'm all for Cody being the NWA champion too. It it fits Hell very yeah. well. Hell yeah! I wish this was the ending. Yeah, I kind of wish it was the ending, too, because, uh, I mean, we'll get to it when we get to it, but I think that the ending was kind of strange, but, um, yeah, um, it's a couple matches down the line. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a mixed thing. I, I, for the moment, at the end of it, I wish it was the ending. For the actual match itself, I'm glad it wasn't the main event. That's a good point, yeah. Can't disagree with that. But, man, then we had <laughs> this... This crazy video package. Now, you guys had mentioned ahead of time that there was this whole story with Joey Ryan, and I didn't know anything about it. Uh, another note that I had written myself about just the production quality was pretty, like, fun. And they're following this story of killing Joey Ryan, and I'm like, all right, this is either just beyond stupid, and I'm going to hate this with a passion, or this is going to be one of my favorite things of the night. I mean, that transitions us into the Chicago street fight where Hackman page defeated Joey Janela. And it was one of my favorite things of the night. <laughs> uh, First off, uh, you had said before, I'd have a, a very quick impression of Penelope Ford. I had two impressions of her by the end of the night. My very first impression was, wow, she is really hot. But then later on, holy shit, is she athletic? I called her Laura Croft by the middle of that match because she was like getting in Paige's face and then ducking him with the backflips. She was, uh, she might legitimately be the biggest standout person in this whole entire event for me, where I was just like, I did not see that coming. She's doing fucking cartwheels and flipping around and all this. And I'm just like, all right, I thought she was just like, like a Velvet Sky type. Like she'd kind of, she looks nice. And maybe she, like, gets a shot in every once in a while, and that's about it. But she's popping up all this stuff all over the place, and I'm like, damn, why can't we get her against Christopher Daniels? <laughs> like, wouldn't that be a lot better, you know? What did you think about Janela? Uh, uh, he was, he, um, nah. Okay. <laughs> Hangman Page looks great in Hangman. a lot of ways. He looks like he could be a star. Joey Janela looks like he's an indie guy, I think, to me. And that it's comes off like an insult, and it should in the way the, the context of what it is. But 
of course, indie guy isn't a bad thing in the in certain regards, but it's like you can see which if there's three people in this match, if you've got two contracts going around, you don't give one to Joey Janela. You know, I, I'd I'd agree with that. This I match was dangerously stu- was stupidly dangerous or dangerously stupid, whichever yeah. way around. Good way around God, it. yeah, because man, there were a couple spots where I'm like, ah, oh, this is kind of funny. We've got like the cracker barrel they're going to do something where they roll this and then it was like oh, okay he just jumped over it that's fun the flip into the crowd like i was like mm, all right that was a little bit dangerous whatever but that power bomb through the table that was stupid. what was worse the power bomb or the fucking the, the, finish? the finish the finish actually looks more controlled yeah oddly ball. enough that's the thing like the... even though i would never suggest doing a reverse pole driver off the ladder <laughs> through a table God damn, that rite of passage thing was just sort of that's the probably the craziest spot that I've seen from this year as far as just like why did you try that? And it worked, he thankfully. The way he wanted it to cuz like I guess you know he he kind of let it go and it that was able to make it safer in a way. But if he had just like done it straight and held on, ugh, that could have been real bad. That uh, <laughs> you could have seen somebody die. Yeah, I just don't know how you can control that sort of thing. Well, and that but that's land. the thing. He was the Joey killer. like, And he was trying to kill Joey. And uh, that powerbomb made me gasp. Oof. It was, that... he, he obviously lost his grip. Because yeah. he, he missed the second table completely. The guy hit could have easily hit the back of his head on that table. Could but... have been knocked out. Could have broken his neck. Lots of bad things could have happened here. When Janela and Ford were setting up the tables and they were having a lot of trouble with it, I was just like, I don't know if this is really going to end up being a good idea. Not even knowing what spot that they were going to be doing afterward, but just Mm. the way that the ramp was and the way that it was like everything was really tight. I was just like, I don't know. I got to be a feeling about this. But then when he lost that grip of the power bomb, it was just like, oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. That's not to mention the burning hammer on the ladder as well. Oh, God, that one too. That was pretty rough looking. I mean, I've I've seen enough of Adam Page to know that he's a guy that will literally go to any lengths to get himself like over. And from what I've heard of Joe Janela, he's like a street fight like maestro essentially. So this is his kind of territory. But it was I I was watching that through like my hands through my eyes. Like I just couldn't. I I I didn't want to watch it. It was t- it's I like fun street fights. This was far too dangerous for me. It was kind of one of those things where now that it's over and they didn't die, yeah, you it's, can it's kind of like, okay, but, sigh of relief, but don't ever fucking do some of those things again. Yeah, I was like looking at that and thinking, okay, well, you're lucky you survived this, and mm-hmm. I'm, yeah, you, I don't want to see either of them in this sort of match ever again, because one of them will seriously injure themselves. And then we did the finish, and I'm thinking... All right, well, even though I haven't followed this story, I know just from watching pro wrestling for, you know, however many years I've been watching this stuff, I know at some point we're going to get a Joey Ryan influence in some fashion. Did not expect a bunch of giant penises. (laughs) Okay. And I, above all else, if people have followed Smack Talk and Smart Out Moment for a while, they know I love puns. Right off the bat, they go, a phalanx of phalluses. He has risen. It's a res erection. He has come again. <laughs> yeah, they kept doing it. I'm like, all right, love it, love it, love it, love it. This is amazing. <laughs> and uh, I believe Ian Riccoboni was like, Don, are we, are we sure this is the real Joey Ryan? Are we sure Hangman didn't? Enter some interdimensional portal. Do you know anything about the afterlife? And Cal- Callus just goes, "No, but I know a lot about penises." <laughs> and that's Joey Ryan. I was like, "Wow, man, wow, wrestling." Well, easily my favorite crowd chant for this entire year, and I can't imagine that it's going to get broken at this point. Is he gets taken away, and the crowd start chant starts chanting, "Rest in penis." <laughs> I was like, this is amazing. This if I was giving the smart count moment into the year awards to things that are not WWE related, I'd have to do something when it comes to this. It would have to be like you, you know. 
well, then it, it gets all tough because then people are like, why don't you like this match from Impact? And it's like, I don't watch Impact, you know, like that kind of thing. Or, you know, you just give it a tough. special mention. I might. So, I, at the very least, I might just be like, oh, but you know what? At the end of the year, All In was fucking, you know, like one of these things. You know what was weird? And I mean, there was so much about that segment that was weird. But people in the crowd had blow up dicks. Where did they get the blow up dicks? Blow up dicks are us. <laughs> I assume Joey Ryan had some sort of merch table or something like that in the during the Starcast thing or the convention. You'd probably buy them there. Yeah. Or they would have handed them out beforehand and say to to a couple of people and say, "Okay, Joey Ryan's coming out, so you need to put out your inflatable dicks at some point and stuff." <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they'd be above planting stuff in the audience. <laughs> but I mean, it was it was just this was a fun side of wrestling. It's like a lot of it, it's like the majority of shows. Like, if this was to happen all the time, then it wouldn't. It would be like, okay, this is just ridiculous at this point. But there's enough Rid- variety. It would be ridiculous. Ah, uh, yeah, that's what you did. So five on five, Survivor Series rules. The Druids of the Undertaker versus the Dicks of Jerry Ryan. Who wins? Be the Undertaker versus the Undertaker. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like you said, if this was something that happened all the time, it would be like I'm so embarrassed to watch pro wrestling. But I did not expect going into All In that one of my favorite things of the entire night would be a bunch of giant dicks. You know, just kind of in theory, if you were to go, you think you're going to like the Cody Rhodes and Nick Aldis match, or you think you're going to like, say, uh, Okada and Scroll, or do you think you're going to like I don't know, big dicks? <laughs> and I'd be like. Well, yeah. <laughs> and at the end of the night, I'm going, hey, rest in penis. That's pretty funny. So hats off to them. I mean, this was silly as fuck, and I loved it. And then that's followed by my favorite match of the night, Jay Lethal against Flip Gordon. Uh, Jay Lethal comes out as Black Machismo with Lanny Poffo, uh, recipient of the Fuck That Guy Award. Brandy Rhodes comes out again, and now you have another note of, again, Brandy Rhodes, super hot. Yeah, yeah. This one, this one stood out to me mostly because I was surprised that she came back out for Flip. And, yeah, I, I don't want to drone on too much about it, but Brandy Rhodes, A+. Plus. <laughs> and uh, the match itself was good. I really enjoyed... I've always enjoyed Jay Lethal. I've I've loved the Black Machismo stuff since he started doing it in TNA. I was sad that Gordon didn't win here. I was really like, but you finally made it. You were all in. Come on, you have Brandy with you, and I just like I was just like ah, sad. Well, I mean, I wasn't obviously invested in this enough to know too much about the whole Flip Gordon situation and all that, but realistically i look at that and i go well that makes sense you know he was put through a table earlier in the night he wrestled another match jay lethal's ring of honor champion you don't want every title to change hands that kind of a thing so i kind of looked at that and i was like okay this makes sense this puts flip gordon on the map a little bit still gives uh the ring of honor world title a little bit of a spotlight and they don't have to change any of their plans going forward like it makes sense to me I like the little spots of him thinking that she was Miss Elizabeth. That was funny. Uh, yeah, I just, I overall, I think from start to finish, by the end of the whole thing, I think that this was probably my favorite match. I wouldn't go that far, but I thought it was really good. It was a, it was a very good match. Um, Flip Gordon's has improved considerably in the last year or so. I think this association with the Bullet Club and the Elite Gang has uh, helped him considerably. Uh, it was it was a good match. I I was never in any doubt that Jay Leaf was going to retain when I knew it was going to be Flip Gordon. I think just making the card was his win rather than actually. And I don't think Ring of Honor would trust him as the world champion at this point, even if it was only for a short term thing. He, he he might get there in the future, but at this point in his career, he's just not quite ready for it. 
uh, Jay Lethal was always great. The snapping in between being real Jay Lethal and Black Machismo was quite fun. Just like getting slapped on the chest and he changes from one side to the other. Um, lethal injections were good, as they always are. I like the ending a lot. I really like the uh, the top rope cutter and then the lethal injection. Yeah, it was, and I think Flip gave a good and enough count of himself that he could be like a reasonably big deal in Ring of Honor going forward. And then obviously it led to once he lost, it led to the ending, which was Bully Ray coming out. They're seriously pushing him ridiculously hard for a guy of his uh, age and weight. It was, <laughs> but mostly age. <laughs> yeah, and then you had uh, Colt Cabana come out to even the odds a little bit. And um, I mean that quite literally in terms of the white side of things. <laughs> uh, uh, Colt Cabana helps uh, get him on the shoulders. We get to see a little shield triple power bomb for a table. Well, that I wanted to bring up. Did they boo, or did they say ooh? Yeah, I, think, uh, I think they were. I think they were, were, the... <laughs> were they saying boo earns? <laughs> I was saying boo Because <laughs> if they say boo, it's one thing of just like, oh, get that fucking WWE shit out of here. If they're going ooh, then maybe people have a reason to say what Bruce Pritchard and Eric Bischoff had but said. They where they're always like, go ooh ah whenever yeah, they, they do yeah. the fire bomb. It's, but it's, it's, it shows that people do want to get behind it. Because kind of the same do, regard that... like. Roman Reigns in the shield is different than Roman Reigns. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, that's another thing that we've talked about before, but like all three of us, to a certain extent, like Roman Reigns and want to see Roman Reigns succeed. And if people are willing to even do like a supportive Roman Reigns thing on a show that has nothing to do with WWE, it goes to show WWE, look, you've got something with this guy. Stop fucking it up. Because it's, it's WWE that's fucking it up. It's not Roman at this point. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I go by a back and forth. I think that it's mostly WWE's fault that Roman Reigns should have enough strike right now that he should be able to influence his character and he's not doing it. Because well, that, he's, too yeah. much of a, he's too much of a company guy and that's the same thing that happened to John Cena. It was like a sense of, okay, I'll just do what you want because you're the boss type thing. It's like, actually stand up for your character if you think what's going on is like, shit and you don't want to do it yeah i agree he's got enough strokes now it's not like i can just take him out of the thing oh, okay we'll just get rid of you then it's like... uh but i think it was mainly just like an excitement to see the triple power bomb i mean they really struggled to get bully ray up and <laughs> down and thing but i do like yeah that was a that was a pretty bad struggle <laughs> but i do like B- bully ray just like looking around and like Oh shit! And then as soon as he finishes saying that, he goes through the table. He, he's a great heel. That was refreshing too, being able to hear people curse. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, there was a lot of that. <laughs> now, I know that people have left comments before in the podcast and stuff, and been like, "There's too much cursing on here and stuff." And fuck them. Yeah, yeah it's kind of my my you. philosophy is sort of like cursing's fine. It's not gonna hurt anybody. It's not like uh, we're trying to say fuck every other word or something like that, but. Yeah, if you're about to get thrown through a table, you're not going to go, oh, uh, what in tarnation? Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, oh, gosh. No, you're going to go, ah, fuck, or in that case, shit, you know, because that's just what comes out. You know, you don't stub your toe and just go like, ah, cheese and crackers. Like, <laughs> it's just not really, unless you're the type of person that does that, and then you've got a hell of a lot more training than I do uh, keeping your mouth shut. But I like that. That was a nice little touch, too. Um. I almost thought they were going to drop him <laughs> when they were picking him up because that was a struggle. Three people tried to pick up Bully Ray. Meanwhile, some other people in the past could just like one person pick him up. Um, oh, I don't know why this reminded me of it, probably because it's just a really big guy. But there was one other good joke that I remembered on the uh, roast of Bruce Pritchard. Somebody said um, Dave Meltzer reported that Mabel's going to be on the he's going to be the third panelist or something. But I think he's got a long term booking elsewhere. <laughs> And then people are like, oh, too soon. And the person was like, eh, not soon enough. <laughs> I was just like, that's pretty mean, but I laughed. Um, so, yeah, Jay Lethal retains over Flip Gordon. And then that leads us to Kenny Omega defeating Pentagon, who they start off and they say, you could call him Pentagon Jr. or Pentagon or Pentagon Dark or Penna 
or Penda El Zero. And I'm like, how many fucking names this guy Yeah, have? he's got a lot of names. And that, of course, made me think of Penta Pobashi, which just made me laugh, at the very least. Um, I'm glad it made someone, though. Yeah, you know. Same as my, like, Hexagon Dark and all that other kind of jokes. Yeah. I laughed. That's all that matters to me. Uh, not as good as I was hoping that it would be. I liked it, but honestly, I expected a little bit more. It, it was exciting. I think it's it, it's difficult because it's, like, the first time they'd ever had a match together, so there's really no history to go back on. They're kind of going in blind. And there's also the case of, like... They're probably trying to save themselves a little bit for, even though this is a big show, for they both have other commitments to promote their own promotions that they need to probably put a bit more focus and attention into. Like it's, it felt like Omega was working at eighty percent of what he could do, and Penta was probably about eighty five, ninety percent. He was doing a little bit more, I think. Uh, but it was still like a very good match. Yeah, I mean, I'm not crapping on it. It's not like it was a bad match or anything like that, but I kind of looked forward to that more than almost any other match on the card and thought that that would be like, you know, blow out of the water, just amazing type stuff. And I was like, hey, package pile drivers are cool. I miss those. Like that kind of thing. And I was just like, yeah, this, this is good. So what is the like average number of V triggers that get hit that gets hit per match? I'd say at least it it gets close to a dozen on some matches. This dude, and I mean, it kind of makes sense because I guess if that's your bread and butter, you're going to keep going for it. But this dude hits so many knees to the head. Well, keep doing what works, I guess. I mean, I, I kind of say go by the lines of, I mean, he just does a load of V-triggers because it like looks realistic. That's like a move that he's very good at and it hurts his opponent. But then I go the lines of, yeah, but he has to hit 12 of them to win a match. Like, clearly that's not working for him. Maybe he could try like, a roundhouse kick to the head. He might only have to do two of those before he gets to win. But, you know, it's it, it's, a, it's a nice, it's a cool-looking move. And that's kind of all you really need at this point, if you're Kenny Omega. That's true. And, and there was some, like, nice spots in it. I liked the, um, the, the package pile driver on the apron was, like... It was not. It was nicely done. It's scary as fuck because, like, you just assume yeah. that he's, you just assume that he's just dropped in completely. But uh, Pentagon uses that move so frequently that he knows how to do it as safely as anybody. Um, I just and, miss file drivers in general. I love oh, yeah. file drivers. Yeah, it's a shame that we don't get to see him in WWE anymore. But um, I mean, it makes sense. It's a dangerous move, but still, just sort of like I grew up watching. Pile drivers, and it's just like, man, I do miss that. It's kind of like if they just randomly took out like the super kick, I'd be like, crap, you know. Well, I, I don't think they'll ever get rid of that, unfortunately. No, <laughs> since everybody I, needs to use it, yeah. Now. But I yeah. really like this match. I mean, I I think a lot of people, for whatever reason, like there there was some that I know very well that are just like. Yeah, Penta can do it, and he's gonna pull off the upset. And I'm like, yeah, you don't know what you're dealing with if you really think Pentagon has a shot here, because they're not gonna have the IWGP champion lose. But I did enjoy the match. I I always enjoy whenever either one of these two are fighting. They just give it their all, and I I like that Kenny Omega. Really, Bill, he can hit 15 V triggers, doesn't matter. All he needs is one one winged angel, and that's it. I love that about his finisher. They, they're doing a great job of protect, protecting that. It's like to the point where the person that does manage to kick out of it is going to get like a massive reaction. Yes. Well, then at the end of this, the lights go out again. And, of course, it feels a little bit different than when it just blinked out here and there. So they're trying to play it up a little bit. Like, oh, man, okay, we lost the feed a little bit or something like that. And Pentagon uh, is back up and attacking Kenny Omega. And, hey, look at that. It's not Pentagon. It's actually Chris Jericho. Which, this was so fucking cool. Like, I knew, you know, because they did the whole... 
I'm going to call it the ECW thing because that's what I associate it most with, where, hey, the lights go out and, you know what I mean, somebody's here. And Jericho had just been so good all year. Why he wasn't higher ranked on the PWI 500, I'll never know. This dude has been fucking awesome this year. It was probably because he's only had like two or three matches. I don't care. So did Lesnar. Which point? (laughs) Where was Lesnar ranked? Four. No. He was four. Lesnar was number four. Yeah. Oh, fuck you. (laughs) He shouldn't even be 40. Like, uh, Jericho is just so good, and he's just playing this wild man so well, and I, I'm I'm sad that the cruise won't be streamed. I'm seriously considering buying tickets because Jericho is just a master when it comes to storytelling, and I just want to see as much as I can of what he's doing. It's kind of moments like this that keeps in my mind that Jericho is the greatest person to have ever done this in this era, at least. Because he he picks his moments so well to just be in the spotlight. And at the end of this show, this big like all in show where obviously there'll be a lot of people talking about how great the show was overall, how good the production looked, how big a moment this is for professional wrestling in general. And then there'll be loads of people just thinking about Chris Jericho at the end of this night. And it's like, you took the like the biggest night outside of WWE this entire year, and you still managed to make it a, a bit about yourself. Which is gives just, them a hell of a lot more promotion for that cruise. It's that makes yeah. perfect sense. It's the type of thing that it's like, yeah, smart business man. Just <laughs> can't fault him, you know. And he, and he didn't go back on his um promise to not wrestle in a on American he, soil because he didn't he technically up. wrestle he just be up Omega after the uh, after the bell right you know what though even if he does that I don't think that people should give him shit oh no but it's just like well, I, yeah I wouldn't, technically I, speaking I would know. never give him shit for it if he hadn't said that he wasn't going to do it but it's yeah. kind of the Jericho mantra to say that he's going to do one thing and actually does the complete opposite plans change <laughs> I <laughs> bring that up I just, I'm going to just sing the praises of Chris Jericho. He's on on a personal level. He's fucking probably the first name on that Mount Rushmore. And he keeps solidifying his place in my mind. Like he's so good. And I, I can't wait to see what 2019 brings. Oh, then we had the match between Marty Skrull and Kazuchika Okada. I gotta give it to Callum. This might have been the best wrestled match of the night. This is probably my second favorite. Uh, this I would was say, hundred percent my favorite. Just Okada's the greatest, and Skull is not at that level, but very close to it. Well, it was a good way to put him over and show that. I mean, I know at least enough that, like, what they had mentioned ahead of time, or what we talked about on the preview, that. There was this whole differentiation between the weight classes and everything. So Skrull's going in as the heel, for sure. And he's also going in as the underdog. But he puts up a good fight. And by the end of it, you could tell that there's like that kind of like begrudging respect type of thing. He loses, but he looks good in his loss. So there's nothing to complain about as far as I'm concerned. You know what I mean? I I did not expect him to win. I don't think Callum you sure didn't expect him to win either, did no, you? No, hundred percent not called it. Um I did have a false hope spot when he nailed him with the fucking umbrella and hit the rainmaker. I thought maybe they go with Okada's losing now because he's so relaxed with not having the pressure that he's too relaxed kind of thing, you know? But I love this match. I my favorite spot probably of the night is Rainmaker grabs him, does the two oh five with his hands, and then on the five, Marty breaks the fingers. I just thought that was so good. Like Ugh. Very good stuff. 
yeah, it's it's it, a fantastic match. Uh, like there's so much to unpack really with like Akada is coming out in a more traditional attire. Like he used to be coming out with the balloons on his uh, tied to his legs and the red tights and stuff like that. But now he's looks more like his old self, which makes me think that he's transitioning back into being more serious and focused and determined to recapture the title now that he's had like his time off, his time in the, the sun being a bit more relaxed about everything. Even though he, he does still look quite relaxed, he seems to be getting more focused, more intense in each match. Uh, I think these spots where Skrull was like clearly being outpowered and outsized, where he was just having a few hope spots of, like chops to the chest, and Akada was just no selling them and like smiling in his face, just daring him to do even more. Uh, like the finger break, the the missile drop kick off the top by Akada, like his his drop kick on its own is like one of the best in the entire business. But I think his missile drop kick is highly underrated as well. Um. I like the fact that he had to use like two rain, well, three actually rainmakers to beat Skull in the end. Like, after the first one, he wasn't able; he had been too tired out by the repeated chicken wings to, yeah, because that would have made him quite full anyway, eating all those chicken wings. But you know, it's like uh... <laughs> I was just thinking to myself, I'm like, man, repeated chicken wings sound really good. <laughs> yeah, but but um, yeah, so it tied him out. So showing that Skull had managed to get like getting to a point where he was very like fatigued and couldn't capitalize on the first time he hit his finisher. I mean, it must be quite difficult for people that aren't too used to seeing a Carter to see him hit a tombstone pole driver and then transition that into a clothesline, which is his finishing move. <laughs> like I assume that some people that have just watched this because they'd seen the hype of it and just think, Okay, he's hit a tombstone. That's like the Undertaker's move, and now he's just gonna what hit a clothesline and win. It's like, but it 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 was a very well told story. It definitely exposed the idea of like the junior versus the heavyweight, and Skrull was like the underdog throughout. It was quite a split crowd, and by the end of it, most people were behind Skrull, which I think was the way the match was laid out to be. And yeah. not everybody from the Bullet Club can win. No. Yeah, and he was the perfect guy to take the fall. And I, I can't say enough. I'm, love the match. Probably the best wrestled match of the night. I just thought it was great. Well, then we had our main event, which was the six man tag. And two was... minutes into it, you can clearly hear. I'm going to assume it was the referee, but somebody clearly said. It's ten fifty one. You have to go home immediately. Yeah, yeah. You could hear that that was the case. Time. And I, d- I don't know what was the one thing that caused them to be so rushed for time. I'm gonna guess it was Joey Ryan's thing being well. I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm reflecting too much on the ending. But now the Joey Ryan thing seemed like it went on too long. Potentially, maybe, but. I th- I think it might have just been this is the first time that they were planning a show and they probably thought, okay, well, this should be like a 20 minute segment. This should be a whatever. And they just didn't account for overflow. Yeah, that's that's probably the case. I think like looking back on it now, like certain things like the Joe Ryan thing going on quite a long time. I think the Cody and Nick Aldis match didn't need to be as long or the celebrations afterwards didn't need to be as long and overdrawn or the entrances. Um, the amount of time that they spent. In Cody's uh, thing with the whole DDP thing, that was like maybe like what, like four or five minutes. Yeah, it seemed. even having the Matt Cross versus MJF match in general, yeah, probably could have been something that you put on the on the uh, like zero hour thing, or you just put both of them in the battle royal. Instead. Well, if each match went a minute past what they were supposed to, you figure that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven eight matches right there it's already eight minutes difference and that can make all the difference in the world you know mm-hmm. and that's just one minute per match so it is a shame because this match was had clearly been cut short from mm-hmm. what it was originally supposed to be i still say this should have been in, in the fourth position and cody should have closed because to me lasting impressions means a lot and the lasting impression of this show was 
One, two, three. Okay, that's it. Young Bucks win. Bye, everybody. Off. Yeah, that was super abrupt, and that really kind of just. But if we that that sucks. But if we look at the flip of that side of that, it's kind of a case of okay. So if this match goes forth and goes as long as it's supposed to, then the Cody Nick Aldis match only has to go can only go like ten minutes. That's true. And you you probably also get the abrupt ending rather than get like the. I, even though I thought these celebrations were overdrawn, instead of seeing like Cody hoisted up with the title and stuff like that, you would just have to cut away immediately. So maybe it was actually smarter to have that in the middle where they could actually get the full spectacle of it open out of the way. Rather than... I think in general they should have just cut that Matt Cross match. Probably, yeah. It was probably the, the easiest way of saving up that time. And it, it was quite obvious from the beginning. They were trying to get as much stuff in as possible. I think they did a good job in this, like, 10-minute sprint. It was an exciting match. You could almost say that they were trying to get it all in. Kind of the point. <laughs> you know what I mean? There goes Tony with the puns. It, it, it's Very good tough. match, yeah. though. And better than I thought it was going to be. Um, that ending, though, it, it definitely took away from it. Yeah, lashed. Bandito was very impressive. Just someone that I hadn't seen a lot of. He was he looked very flippy and acrobatic. They were all flippy in this one. Well, Ray was a bit less flippy. He looked in better shape. I'll give him credit for that. He looked in better shape than he did at the um, last New Japan show I saw him at. But apparently, he's only got a few more dates beyond this one, and then he's uh got no further booking so presumably he'll be wwe bound very soon i'm ready for it because ray is one of the few guys that really fits the mold for what we expect in a wwe superstar and you know i'm just i think ray deserves it i'm ready for the run i'll i'll hold judgment yeah, if he I'll, pops up on 205 Live, I might be like, great. And if he pops up on Raw and they have another baby face that they have to contend with, and then they book him against Braun Strowman and they do the whole like, oh, he can't beat the big guy. And then he beats him. I'll be like, fuck you. You know, just, yeah, we'll see. But yeah, it was it was, it was a fun little sprint. Kuro Bushi looked very good as he always does. Yeah, Bushi's great. I've seen a couple of things of his by now and everything I've seen him do. It's just like, all right, he's awesome. I get it. I think if he had a bit more like actual tangible success in terms of championships that he won, people would potentially view him as like the best wrestler in the world right now. He his selling is amazing. He's got such a variety of both holds and strikes. Uh, yeah, he's pretty much got. There's there's not someone I've, I see with as few weaknesses as Kota Ibushi. And you know what, uh, speaking of the whole idea of, like, people and their success and mainstream attention and all that, I will have to say that by the end of this, I've changed my mind a little bit. I don't know if I want uh, everybody to go to WWE. There we go. That's the attitude to take. (laughs) Yeah. It's, like, I'm looking at Kenny Omega, and I'm thinking, oh, Kenny Omega should have some great matches with a lot of different people in WWE. And I'd love to see him against like, say, I don't know. just like, for instance, Daniel Bryan to go to answer is Daniel Bryan, but Seth Rollins, another one too. Johnny, uh, Johnny Gargano, another great one. Tommaso Ciampa, vanilla, uh, velvet cruise, uh, velvet cruise. I I, I had the list on the thing that says Jericho cruise. And I looked at that. (laughs) What about Apollo well, Dream? Yeah. <laughs> well. <laughs> the discount versions on the NDC. Yeah. <laughs> um, but at the same time, like, are some of these guys going to be able to get a chance to be anything other than a WWE product if that's going to be the case? And I know people have argued that before, and I've always been of the case where I've been thinking, like, I just want things to merge because it's a lot easier and it's a lot simpler. But the way that WWE treats some of these people and the way that they book things just makes me go, this felt fun. I enjoyed it overall, like this whole event. I mean, there were some hiccups here and there, but hey, I'd take a couple of hiccups here and there on an overall very, very entertaining card that has 
fun elements, comedic spots, serious spots, great athleticism, and it actually tells some fucking stories too over a WWE event where maybe I hate 75% of it, you know? You don't know what you want. I know what you want, and then I give it to you. Yeah, we didn't have to worry about that here. Yeah, and I I have to admit, part of this maybe that I enjoyed was just I didn't have to do live coverage of it, and I didn't have to... Because, I mean, every time that I'm watching a pay-per-view for the past couple of years, I'm writing up a Bleacher Report article while I'm typing out what's happening on my site and trying to remember as much as I can to be able to do this post-show. And then, of course, I'm doing this post-show now. I'm going to have to edit this, and I'm going to write something up for e-wrestling news. But at the same time, doing a podcast, reviewing stuff, and then writing up a, a quick reaction, like, overall review... It's a lot easier than doing live coverage. And nope, that was my bag this weekend and I'm exhausted. Yeah. So I'll give them a little bit of a, a handicap when it comes to that. WWE doesn't have that they don't uh, afford that luxury to me. Of course because they don't do anything for me. Um so maybe that put me a little bit more towards happy stuff when it comes to this, but just in general, it was just like, I felt like by the end of this, the stuff that I didn't love wasn't really all that much of a problem. And the stuff that I loved was great. And at the end of it, if I showed somebody this card, outside of the fact that I would have to explain all the penis stuff, <laughs> yeah. if I showed it to them, I think that they would walk away with this and go, wow, these guys are athletic as hell. And this is actually like a lot of fun and everything. Whereas a lot of WWE shows by the end of it, it's like, Wait, so why did that? Uh, that's just stupid. And what you're pushing this guy for that reason, and you're doing this for that. And like the women's match was better than a lot of the matches that we get in the women's division in WWE. And even though the WWE's women's division is so much better than it's been in the past, we still get stuff that sucks. The Chicago Street fight was brutal, and spots were dangerous as hell. And I, of course, do not think that they should be doing power bombs like that and stuff. But at the same time, it was like, okay, well, that's the brutal thing. And then here's the silly thing. And then here's the, you know, like they, they had a, a good balance of this. Really, the only negative that I can say is they didn't time it out perfectly. Which, hey, it's their first show, you know? Yeah. I, I so what happens like, now? Uh, I'd, I'd say there's enough basis of the book of this to and there'll be enough goodwill off the back of this to do another one in the near future i guess the 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 real thing that's what's next is jericho cruise ring of honor sh and new japan show at madison square garden uh wrestle kingdom obviously and stuff like that there's there's a lot of big events outside of like the wwe sphere of things which will be happening but obviously a lot of that still rests on the idea that the Young Bucks, Cody, and Kenny Omega will be out of contract soon with their respective promotions. Well, I think it's per uh, it's important to, first off, everybody who was on this card, they just boosted their price. Oh, yeah, definitely. That's great. You know, it sucks for the promoters because they're going to have to pay more, but that's going to, I think, be like a really good injection of adrenaline for you know just that adrenaline shot for the indie wrestling scene in general because it's going to be like okay this show ends up having flip gordon on it awesome people are going to want to go for it you might not have three or four or five of the guys that are on this card on some major league wrestling or you know like an otw type of thing or uh ecpw or whatever different things that you've got but you might have one and if you have Say, who's another guy that was uh, popping up in here? Austin Gunn for, you know, I didn't get to see him, but now I know that he exists. And a lot of other people know that he exists. WWE knows these people exist more. You got to know that a lot of people in WWE were watching this. And hopefully, of course, knock on wood, not going to do that because I know it'll pick it up on the mic. Hopefully, a lot of people behind the scenes we're watching this and not just the boys. Cause it's one thing for Xavier Woods to be like, dude, you see all in, it was fucking great. It's another thing 
for Vince McMahon to watch All In and for him to be like, fuck, they did a damn good show. How do we use that momentum? How do we learn from their success? How do we get to talking to different people and start going, you know, that uh, that so-and-so guy, he looked really good. Maybe we should think about that. Maybe we should look at this Hangman Page guy. Maybe that Penelope Ford could be somebody that we could bring into the Mae Young Classic next year. Maybe, shit, maybe the guys that were working the production. It was just a great show. So maybe those people get better jobs out of this. Like, I can't see any negative coming out of this whatsoever. Except for maybe Joey Janela's neck. <laughs> it's just like, that's going to be a major positive. And another thing that's going to come out of this, Hell in a Cell better be fucking great or WWE's going to eat a lot of shit. It's only a couple weeks away and people are going to go into that. That's the next event, like WWE related. So if people watch Hell in a Cell and it's filled with the same kind of garbage that pops up here and there, people are going to go, yeah, see, All In was better. I already know that Super Showdown's not looking to be all that fucking great. Uh, That's a hell show, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not like, well, we have these plans for Hell in a Cell, but hey, we promise we're going to make it up to you at, you know, in October by the time that comes around. All in, I say, major thumbs up. And now it's kind of like when NXT goes into SummerSlam or something and people go, yeah, try to top that. I don't think Hell in a Cell is going to do that well. Just putting it out there. Well, I loved... This show, I hope they do it again yearly. You know, it's just, it's a perfect show. They kind of have to. I I don't want them to do it to a point where it gets diluted, but they captured so many great things. And I mentioned this beforehand. I believed in the concept so much that I've literally been working on, been paying for, or something to the case with Starcast and all in since Wednesday evening. This has been my entire latter half of my week. And while I would have changed the order of the main event just because I feel like I really wanted that Cody ending and I would have had a little less with the Joey Ryan stuff. Sorry. It was hilarious, but I would have cut it down a little bit. And then I, I think you're sitting on as perfect of a show as you're going to get in a situation like this. Major thumbs up from me, and I can't wait to see what happens with Cody in the NWA title now. Uh, in terms of my overall thing, I think this was a very good show. I've seen a lot better shows, just to be frank with that side of things. I know what I like, and this had a lot this was a, a fun show overall. It's probably one of the most fun shows I've seen. I wouldn't say it's one of the best. Have you seen better shows from North America? Yes. Okay. I've seen better shows from WWE. But Oh, this wasn't like the, you know, the best, like everything amazing, best thing that's ever happened oh, no. for a wrestling it was, no, type it was, thing. It was no. a very fun show and it was a celebration of the different silly like the the great, the silly, the fantastical aspects of professional wrestling. It's what it's what I, I, my thoughts about it is it's what people like the Young Bucks, Cody, Kenny Omega think that pro wrestling should be. And that makes me, well, it, it builds up my idea of the fact that these guys can't go to WWE because they all go to WWE with the, foot thing, with the mindset of, okay, we've got to change things around here and then we'll be probably shut down quite often with uh, that approach but it just it's it's great to have this as like a big alternative that people can just sit down and watch have a bit of fun with because i don't think it took itself it took itself seriously in the sense that they wanted to be a a big new thing for wrestling like this can be like the new thing going forward, and this could be a thing that other independent promotions can use, other independent wrestlers can use to build up their stock, maybe just eventually become some kind of competitor to WWE or at least a major enough alternative. 
but they didn't take themselves too seriously in terms of okay every match has to be fantastic and well thought out and everything on those lines it was they they're all good in their like own little own way and like within a vacuum but uh there were there were flaws in each section but nothing that was serious enough that you leave with a bad taste in your mouth which is usually the case WWE where especially with recent pay-per-views in the last couple of years or so it's a case of picking out all the booking errors and like you say Tony like 70% of it is like things that you're either disappointed by or angry about or are questioning what the logic is in it and then you're picking out the good stuff out of the bad rather in this right. way you're picking the bad stuff out of the good because the bad stuff is just very minimal but you, it's still there and it's still stuff that could be improved upon but overall it's a show that will live very long in the memory it was a fantastic achievement to sell out an arena that size the crowd was so into it all night you could tell that they were desperate for this thing to be a success and even if it wasn't as good as it was and it was a very good show they would have pushed it to be successful because it's clear there's a huge well, maybe not a huge but a significant audience out there that wants this different they want this alternative to succeed and do very well because and it's not because they hate wwe it's because they want wwe to wake up and be better and this is the sort of it, like supporting this ventures and supporting all of the different promotions that are associated with this event is the way to try and convince WWE to get better. So, yeah. going forward, will you be keeping a closer eye on Ring of Honor, Impact, uh, New Japan, all that kind of stuff? Well, put it this way, it's made me more it's interested in watching that stuff than Raw and SmackDown every week. But it's a case of, I can't devote all of my life to professional wrestling, unfortunately. <laughs> you have to pick, yeah just the way things are with most people you just have to pick and choose which one but if you saw something in here that you like and you prefer better to Raw and Smackdown then like if you really liked the Kenny Omega match then maybe you want to watch more New Japan Weekly or if you saw like Adam Page and uh, Christopher Daniels and thought they were great and stuff like that and maybe you want to tune in to Ring of Honor more or you saw Joe Janela and people like that and you can see some of the independent promotions he works at or uh, MJF in um, MLW and stuff like that. They're, they're, all these people work for so many different promotions that if you want to follow that individual or follow a group of individuals, you'll be able to find a show that they're on consistently. And check that out, and you might enjoy that more than Raw Smackdown. And then take Raw and Smackdown out of your schedule and add this one in instead. <laughs> the important thing is there are options. This show proved that. It's all about, you know, kind of like streaming services. You got to find the right one for you and, you know, spend your money. Yeah. And I can't de devote a bunch of attention to a lot of other things. So I know a lot of people are like, you know, it's a shame that you don't watch Impact and Ring of Honor or New Japan and CCW and all this other kind of stuff like that. And it's just like, well, I don't have enough time to watch all WWE stuff, let alone all the other stuff or sleep. But um, next uh, next Ring of Honor thing or something like that, maybe I'm actually going to sit down and watch it now, you know? And then I'll probably hate it, and then I'll be like, ah, fuck this, and <laughs> you know what I mean? But, it probably won't be as good. You know yeah. what, though? It says something where we're working on it, guys. Tony's coming around. We're going to be able to cover more independent shit. And it wasn't like Impact, where the last time I turned it on, I was like, you know what, I'll give it a shot. And I watched two segments and was like, I can't do this <laughs> and shut it off. So credit to them. I thought it was a great show. I was very happy to have this be on a week that there wasn't like some extra WWE crap that we would have to cover instead. Like if this would have been like next week, I would have been like, ah, crap, we have to do like the Hell in a Cell stuff and we don't have any room for it. So this was perfect timing for that. No, they're too busy touring the globe. Like putting their superstars through an immensely horrible schedule where they have to travel from London to America, back to China, and then Japan. Japan. Yeah, it's like, I mean, if there's anything that can convince most of these people not to come to WWE, it's probably that schedule. Yeah. Well, just a creative freedom, too, like you were saying. Yeah. But we'll see. 
you know, that's next week that we're going to deal with. And if you want to be aware of when we do that kind of stuff next week, subscribe to the YouTube channel and ring the little bell for notifications and stay tuned to smartoutmoment.com and follow us on Facebook and Twitter at smartoutmoment. And if you want to show you more support for different things that are like this, then try uh, hitting up that Patreon and throw your spare change our way. Uh, you know, I think it's the $20 mark is where you can request special features for different things. So keep that in mind too, if you're interested in those kind of things, if you want, you know, an extra, you know, top rope list or something like that. Uh, I think that next week we are going to be doing our main event is going to be one more match, which is the first time that we'll be doing that. Something else ends up happening. We might have to change it, but we'll see. And I'll pass this around a little bit and come back to myself for plugs a little bit later. But uh, um, okay, or Robert, whoever wants to take it. <laughs> oh, I guess I'll take it. Um, Jim, <laughs> I am on Twitter and Instagram at Dude Felice. I am doing a lot with WrestleZone, WrestleZone.com for your daily wrestling news, on-site coverage of All In and Starcast. Great stuff going on over there. Support me. Buy a t-shirt at timeclearapparel.com. That is my apparel brand that I'd like to do more with. And what else do I have going on? Um, yeah, just follow me everywhere at Dude Felice. And the weeklies are the weeklies, and I always do the triple threat. So keep an eye on that. Yeah. Uh, short and sweet. Follow me on Twitter at Wigmeister14. Have a few ideas bouncing around, which you might you might hear of in the near future. You might not. I'm, I'm going to keep it vague like that. But there are ideas rattling around in my brain, but you'll be the first to hear of them. Except for these guys, they'll be the first to hear them. You'll be second to hear them instead. <laughs> <laughs> and now all wrestling. He's got this uh, invention. It's going to change the world. Yeah, it's called the, um, the Super Kick Party pro- Provider. Like, really? <laughs> yeah, it's like a little box, and then you open it up, and then immediately there's super kick power. Oh, I like it. You know how you <laughs> could improve it? How? Penises. I don't, I don't want to super kick penis. <laughs> Vascularity. Uh, <laughs> before we go down that road, uh, let me just circle back around here. If you also want to check out some other stuff that I've got going on, of course, follow me at Tony Mango all over the place and just click around on the different social media accounts because you will see links to all sorts of different things here because I work on far too many projects and spend far too many plates. Fanboys Anonymous being one of them. If you would go to fanboysanonymous.com, you will find my thoughts on different superhero movie things and other kind of topics like that. So, you know, when they pop out something where they say like, Hey, uh, they're going to bring back Leia in episode nine. Then you'll get my comment of awesome. Shame that she died. Episode nine's probably going to suck because the last Jedi ruined everything. Like, you know, like different <laughs> things like that. Uh, yeah, you'll find that on the Weekend Geek and all that. And a couple more things might be happening there, depending on how much time I have. Just stay tuned. And if you want to share your support for those things too, there's the Patreon for that. There's the T Public for both Smart Out Moment and Fanboys Anonymous. Redbubble as well. So lots of things going on. Just start clicking and you'll find it. Thanks for your, showing your support for everything, including listening to this podcast. Make sure you drop your comments below and tell us what you thought of All In, what you thought of the podcast, or anything else that you want to tell us that you think about. Even if it's just, hey, uh, I think that cornbread's great, or something. I don't know. <laughs> I had some cornbread earlier. That's why it popped up in my mind. But we'll talk about that on Snack Talk. And we will see you when we see you, everybody. This has been another Smart Cat Moment, and we're being counted out. Thank <laughs> you.